So David Hume is very modern in the sense that he's a totally anomalous, and he says that it's our cultural habits that create our language, linguistic habits that create our referential framework to the world. And that's all reality is. And uh, he's baffling in a sense that he will say things like, you know, we just presume the sun's going to rise because we are in, it's ingrained in our habit of reference to the world. But in fact, it's a meaningless statement that the sun's going to rise. We, you know, it's an old rhetorical form because the sun doesn't really rise, the earth turns. If we were up to date, we would have it differently. But we use that old rhetorical form. It's embedded in our cultural linguistic history. Okay, so... Now comes another question, and that is um, human nature, or maybe I'm already on human nature, I don't know, but anyway, a deeper question. Um, and that is that once we get into postmodernity, so we're now we're linguistically based, right, in our, in our philosophical contemplation is more or less today epistemological debating. Epistemology is the question, how do you know what you know? So philosophy is normally centered on language today, the problem of language, because language is, if you like, the signification of an epistemological structure. So, you know, you're not really a human being. You're an epistemological structure. <laughs> <laughs> and you signify yourself through language. Anyway, one of the conclusions of this is that human beings don't have a nature. Uh, we do have egos, and uh, we do bad things, a few megalomaniacs around, um, but we don't have a nature. And that's a beautiful gift, I think, of nominalism. It's the gift that we can change, because we're not a substance. Uh, so we can learn different habits and become different people. So now I can make my reference to being tall. A lot of times people say to me, my, you're tall. And I uh, foolishly always take that as a compliment. It's my nature for some reason to think that's a positive comment, but I could have another nature. I could take it negatively, or I could be embarrassed by it, or I could shy away, or I could say, I'm not going to talk to that person. You know, there's a hundred different ways you can take any comment about yourself. And psychology today will say, because it's based on nominalism, uh, that what we really need to deal with is your habit of being in the world. You don't have, there's not a single thing somewhere hidden in you like Freud, that's wrong and that needs to be healed. There's a structure, a relationship of things, and you can modify and change this relationship and how you think about life and, and learn to be someone who reacts to things differently. You don't have to blame yourself, you know, or, be, or feel guilty. Uh, so psychology helps us almost like a, a toolkit today to help us think about how we can rhetorically arrange our self-image. But that came about because of nominalism, because language creates the world. And unfortunately, uh, for some people, but not for us in this room, we human beings are part of the world. We're not part of Plato's uh, world of forms. We're part of the natural world. So we create ourselves. And we can learn to create ourselves. And we don't have to think that there's a self we should be or supposed to be. One of the problems I have with church is this idea of God intended, which comes from Plato and teleology and God intended a certain world. And in my own uh, church, United Church of Canada, I'm saying it slowly because probably this might be seen and somebody will hear it. But anyway, and then so I might be back here again without, without a church. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in the United Church of Canada, often there is this kind of prayer, you know, help us discern what God intended or something like that, or God open up to us what you intended. But it's based on this idea of a transcendental teleology and that God is like a director of a play or something or a writer of a script and then some director comes along and screwed up the script and God, you know, and I say, look, this is what I intended. And 
Um, so anyway, God doesn't have an intention uh, in, nom in nominalistic thought. That those are created from us and from our language use. So now, um, you know, one of the things we're, we want to do in this God seminar is look at these kinds of problems and how people have tried to, to solve them and different models that we have. And I know I have to probably go a bit faster than I am. But, so I want to look at now what... Um, I'm going to skip over some stuff that's really fantastic stuff. <laughs> I'm, going to, <laughs> I'm going to look at Christianity after nominalism. So do we like this picture? The fact of the matter is a lot of theologians do not like this picture. Not at all. Uh, in my experience, it's almost like most theologians do not like the picture. Nominalism terms, turns uh, the old mythic structures of the world and substance and transcendence into ancient ruins. And then we have to... So, you know, ancient ruins are important. Like, you, again, you have to know, understand, appreciate antiquity on its own terms and enter it and think in that context, if you can, because of course you can't get ancient people to come back here and talk to us. We got to, we have to go to them. Uh, but nevertheless, nominalism turns them, if you like, into kind of ancient ruins that we have to explore and imagine and reconstruct and try to figure out how to work. But they're not; it's not a home for us anymore. So that's why a lot of theologians do not like this move at all. But some have cleverly found a way to use nominalism to. Um, defend God and to push very conservative forms of theology. Others, fortunately, have found very liberating ways to use the same stuff, but I'm going to end up saying that we really even need to go beyond that now. Uh, I'm going to say at some point, so I may as well say it now, uh, that God does not exist. And that that's been the hard thing for theologians to accept. That we need to go forward with not with a God who doesn't exist. Because existence is essentialism, is substance. And God really is not that. Uh, God is a, is, a, is a word that we've learned to use to create a universal. And we need to do something a bit different. So, but does that mean there's no hit future for religion? I don't think so. I just think we don't know what it is at this point. We're going to struggle with it. And that's what our seminar probably is going to be about.